It's 12 o'clock. I'm going to speak about Blackout Britain. Uh, my name is Richard Toll. I'm one of the professors of economics here um, in uh, the department. I mostly teach uh, in the third year, so you won't see much of me uh, except for this particular lecture. The topic um, of today is topical. It was inspired by a series of headline, um, headlines in the media a couple of years ago. Uh, here is one. Blackout risks rises as UK energy crisis deepens. UK power supply is enough for winter, uh, says National Grid. National Grid uh, pushing back. No, 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 the lights are going to stay on. Um, some people said this is because of wind, so the green lobby uh, had to push back as well. Are we really heading for blackout Britain? Of course, if that's the headline question, then the answer is no, at least according to this author. He doesn't seem to really understand what is going on in, uh, in, in UK energy. Um, uh, but more recently, uh, this is from last week, uh, in the Telegraph, uh, blackout risk recedes as national grid uh, pays all coal plants to stay on standby. So that is the topic uh, for today. What is really the risk uh, of blackouts? Why is there a risk uh, of blackouts? That's something that we associate with countries like uh, the Congo or the Lebanon uh, rather than the UK. <coughs> um, what are the underlying causes and what is the government uh, doing against this? Um, the risks for blackouts were uh, sort of put under people's attention uh, a couple of years ago when we had a fire uh, in a coal-fired power plant, that's where your ele electricity comes from, and then another fire in another coal-fired power plant, and then third fire in a third uh, coal-fired power plant, all within weeks of each other. Um, and then there was this nuclear power plant that reported there were cracks. Um, so it had to shut down for uh, inspection, uh, and then another um, nuclear power plant also had safety issues and was shut down as well. All within a space of months, five of the major generators of electricity in this country uh, were taken off the grid and actually as we were heading towards peak demand, as we were heading into uh, winter. Um, <coughs> the uh, Office for Electricity uh, Regulation of GEM uh, has put out reports about just how risky uh, the situation is. And that is displayed uh, in these two graphs. Um, in the top one, uh, you're looking at the expected loss of loads. That is essentially how many hours a year do we expect not to have enough electricity where supply falls short of demand. Um, and we have a regulatory standard that this should not happen more uh, than four hours a year or so. Uh, but they expected uh, for uh, last winter uh, that is maybe 10 hours. For this winter it would go up to 15. Um, and next winter it is probably a little bit better uh, going down to four closer to the regulatory standard. Um, and this is all with so-called uh, emergency uh, measures. Um, and that is what is shown on the bottom graph here, that if without these emergency interventions by the government, uh, the risk of a blackout would have been much, much higher. Uh, and that is also shown uh, in this graph, uh, that's actually from the National Grid rather than from Ofgem, um, where we're looking uh, at roughly the same thing. This is essentially how much additional capacity is there expected to be on the uh, electricity grid. That is how much higher is the maximum supply compared to the expected uh, demand. And you see that those percentages uh, are counted in single numbers um, at uh, this moment, right? It's 4%, 5% with emer uh, emergency measures. It goes up uh, to 6 or 7%. So only a little bit has to go wrong and the lights will go out. Um, this uh, slide further highlights that. Uh, at the bottom, uh, you're looking at 
essentially uh, in the bars you're looking at the demands, the peak demands uh, for electricity. That's essentially how much collectively uh, we uh, use uh, electricity, measured in kilowatt hours. Um, and then in the lines you're looking at free alternative assessments of how much electricity there actually is. Uh, in red, there isn't much electricity being imported from Ireland or France. And then in yellow, more is imported. In the blue, more is imported still. If France continues to have problems with its nuclear power plants, as it has now, it will have very little surplus electricity to ship to England. And that means that the red line is the relevant line. And what you see is that we expect on the 12th or in the week of the 12th of December and again uh, in the week uh, of the 9th of January <coughs> that supply comes very very close to the amount. Unless of course there's a cold spell, I'm not sure whether you can see the straight orange line, if it's very cold uh, electricity use goes up because a lot of commercial operations use electric heating as secondary heating so those things start kicking in if it's very cold uh, and in that case, we just have to hope uh, and rely, hope for the friends to actually have surplus electricity to send to us, right? That is, they will have their nuclear power plants repaired uh, within the next couple of weeks. Otherwise, the lights uh, will go out. <coughs> that is essentially uh, what this graph says. Now, why is peak demand for electricity around this time? Very simple. If it's dark out, you turn on the lights, right? So demand goes up for demand for electricity goes up uh, in winter, and the darker it gets, uh, the more electricity we use. Um, and then, as I said, there's also secondary heating that also relies on electricity. Uh, so that is why uh, we are concentrating on uh, winter time. Uh, so we are in a bit of a rough situation, right? Uh, the demand, uh, or the, 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 the light blue that you're looking at here is the reserve, that is essentially if something goes wrong, if you have another fire in a power plant and therefore it needs to be shut off, we always have a little bit of backup of electricity if something goes wrong on the system. Um, and that is at the projected here uh, to be only two, uh, one gigawatt only, so that is a big power plant, right? We just need to have a fire in one power plant and the reserve capacity is all gone. If you have a fire in two power plants at the same time, then we're running short, right? Um, now, if you look at the top figure, uh, <coughs> that is where our uh, electricity comes from. My fuel... Um, there's nuclear on the system, that's the light uh, blue at the bottom, uh, there's some hydro on the system, uh, there's coal, there's biomass, there's gas on the system, there's a bit of, uh, bit of pumped storage. Uh, there's also a lot of wind on the system, that is the orange bit. The problem with wind is that it's unpredictable and intermittent. Sometimes the wind blows and then we have lots of electricity and sometimes the wind does not blow. Unfortunately, in the climate of the UK, the very cold periods are typically also very quiet periods in terms of wind. So there's an anti-correlation between cold and wind. And that means that at the times that our demand for electricity is highest, the winds are at its lowest and we cannot count <coughs> on the orange bar to supply electricity. There's another problem with wind. As if you have a wind turbine, obviously it doesn't work if the wind doesn't blow. Uh, but if the wind blows, it starts turning, and the more the wind blows, the more it turns, and the more or the faster it turns, and the more electricity it generates, or rather, the stronger it turns, and the more electricity uh, it generates. Um, but there's a safety issue there, and that is if you have a gale blowing at a wind turbine, you have to stop the thing, otherwise it'll come apart. So in a big storm, we turn off the wind turbines. And of course, if it's stormy in Brighton, it's stormy in London, it's stormy in Manchester, uh, and so on and so forth. The storm occurs across a wide 
area at the same time. And they had problems with that uh, recently in Australia, where they had a big blackout. And they're still, as you can see from the headlines here, uh, they're still arguing about what actually caused the uh, blackout. But one reason for the uh, South Australian blackout may be that all the wind turbines were hit by the same storm at roughly the same time and were turned off at roughly the same time, which causes a sudden drop in supply on the grid. And if you have a sudden drop of supply on the grid, then the grid goes haywire. It just can't handle with such big shocks, either in demand or supply. You just have wires uh, that uh, get fried. Uh, if that happens, and there are good reasons, or <laughs> it's absolutely certain that this can happen, and there's good reasons to assume that it did happen recently in South Australia, and that is the real reason uh, for the blackout. And the same could very well happen uh, in the UK, where we have, <clears throat> what is it, uh, 12 gigawatts uh, of wind on the grid, and if all of those turbines get switched off at the same time, we have a problem, right? Um, so, how did we get here? I argue, and I'm definitely not uh, the only one to argue, uh, that there's a real possibility of brownouts or blackouts in December, uh, December or January this year, as well as next year. Uh, a blackout is what happened in Australia, that you have a sudden shock to the system and the entire grid goes flat, right? And the entire uh, grid goes out. Um, those are relatively rare. We see this coming, so much more likely in the UK is that we'll actually be looking at brownouts. That the national grid will simply turn off particular areas in order to prevent a more damaging blackout. So that a warning will go out between 5 in the evening and 8, uh, 5 in the afternoon and 8 in the evening, there won't be any electricity in Brighton. Uh, we just turn it off because Brighton is not particularly important. We prefer to keep Gatwick uh, and Heathrow running. Right? Chances are uh, that that is what they will do rather than go for uncontrolled brownout. Um, the immediate causes for this are simple, right, and obvious. There's too little generation capacity on the grid. But how did we get here? Sixth largest economy in the world, right? One of the richest country, one of the country with a proud tradition in uh, engineering. How the fuck did we get here? This is stuff that you would expect in Africa, this is stuff that you would expect in Asia, it's not stuff that you would see in Europe. Um, in order to understand this, you need to understand a little bit about uh, electricity and the electricity market. A fundamental uh, characteristic of, uh, of electricity is that it cannot be stored, or it cannot be stored in large amounts. It's, horrendously expensive. Um, and that means that the market for electricity is very different than the market, say, for peanut butter. Peanut butter is something you can store in your kitchen, it's something you can store in the shop, it's something you can store in warehouses. So supply and demand sort of have to meet on average roughly over a year, right? If you average over the year, supply and demand for uh, peanut butter match each other, that is fine. Not so for electricity, because it cannot be reasonably it cannot reasonably be stored. Demand has to meet supply every minute, right? Um, which immediately implies that you need to have what is called a spinning reserve. You need to have a power plant running in the background that's generating electricity that is not being used in case there is a fault somewhere. That's an immediate economic problem, right? Because who is paying for this power plant that is producing electricity but not selling electricity? Who is covering their costs, right? Um, that is one thing. Um, well, essentially, uh, what is done in the UK and elsewhere um, 
is that there's an auction organized where the regulator says, I want to buy reserve capacity. Who wants to bid for the supply of reserve capacity? That is the amount that is paid. And then that money is recuperated from all other suppliers who essentially are paying a tax on their supply in order to pay for the so-called spinning reserve. Um, <clears throat> there's also uh, other issues that require uh, regulation. We typically think of electricity as electrons moving down the wire, but of course, quantum physics, you can also think of these as waves. If the waves come in different frequencies and they meet each other on a, uh, a cross wire, then they may cancel each other out. So you also need to make sure that every power plant runs at the same clock speed so that you have frequency regulation. Um, and essentially, the regulator needs to step in, and that is what they do in the UK, or are rather, I should say, uh, in England and Wales, as well as in Scotland, as well as in Ireland, right? Uh, they essentially say, this is your clock speed. This is relatively easily done if you have a few big power plants. Of course, if you have a lot of micro-generation on the grid, people putting solar uh, panels on their roofs and wanting to send the electricity into the grid, then it creates problems. Right? because you cannot control those. Uh, but that's another form uh, of regulation that needs to be on the market. And of course, the electricity grid is a natural monopoly. A natural monopoly is, of course, defined as something where there's no competition. That's the monopoly bit. But a natural monopoly is a situation where the costs of providing for competition is greater than the benefits of competition. And the cost of providing for competition of an electricity grid is to have two sets, of, two grids uh, in the country, right? And these things are just so horrendously expensive that the benefits of having competing grids, two wires coming to your house, simply uh, doesn't pay. So it's a natural monopoly. So you have a monopolist, and monopolists must be uh, regulated. <coughs> so the power market is and should be uh, heavily regulated. Uh, this is how the spot market works, or rather the day ahead market. Um, essentially, uh, supply must meet uh, demand. Uh, supply is a curve that is going up. Uh, let's focus on, for you guys, the left-hand side. Um, and this is typically done uh, or uh, visualized as a merit curve. That is, at uh, the left-hand side, you have cheap sources of electricity and they supply first and then as supply goes up you're adding more and more expensive sources of electricity so you typically start with wind and nuclear wind comes at practically zero marginal cost nuclear is very close to zero marginal cost um, and then uh, you get into the more expensive sources of electricity coal uh, where it's not just the power plant that you need in wind, it's not just capital, but you also need to actually pay for the coal. So there is a higher marginal cost, and then gas uh, is a bit more expensive still. Uh, and that is how you build up your uh, supply curve. Uh, and then your demand curve is the almost vertical one uh, that you see there, and the price is set where supply meets demand. Supply is to meet demand every minute, uh, so demand shifts back and forth. Uh, if everybody's asleep, we don't use a lot of electricity. If it's uh, a bright uh, day, we don't use a lot of electricity. But in between the hours, uh, between 5 and 8 in the evening, we use a lot of electricity. Um, and that is what is depicted uh, on the right-hand side uh, here, where you have the night demand, you have the day demand, you have the peak uh, demand. <coughs> and at every point in time, supply meets demand, so the price goes up and down and up and down during the day. Now, that follows trivially. There's an, an immediate implication um, that is sometimes overlooked. Um, and if the price is set where demand meets supply, the implication is that the nuclear power plants and the wind generators are almost always paid more than their marginal cost of electricity supply. So they make lots of money, right? They're always on, and they're always being paid more than the cost of supply. 
if you look at the peakers, right, they are on for only a few hours a day, some even only a few hours a year. So their volume is low, but their margin is also low because they set the price and the price is set equal to their marginal supply cost. So they're not making a profit. Right? So <coughs> base load plants earn lots of money, mid merit ones, the ones in between, uh, earn a lot less, and the pickers earn very, very little. Yet, those peak supplies are crucial for keeping the lights on. So here we have another market failure, or a potential market failure, that nobody is interested in building a peak uh, power plant, because there's just no money in peaking. The money is in the base load. Now, there's a few solutions to this. Um, in California, uh, they tried just to let the market solve this. They just went for an unregulated market for a while. Uh, <laughs> electricity became a tad expensive, right? So you guys uh, are paying, I think, 14 pence a kilowatt hour uh, for your electricity, roughly uh, there. Uh, the wholesale market it did not go up to one pound forty. It did not go up to uh, fourteen pounds. It went up to fourteen thousand pounds a kilowatt hour. <coughs> and yeah, the market could not really tolerate such extreme volatility in electricity prices, or for that matter, such extremely high prices. And uh, it was California, right? I did it in pounds, but obviously they were paying in dollars. Um, <coughs> The market in England and Wales um, used not to have an explicit way of providing peak supply, of providing capacity. Uh, instead, the market is run by so-called bilateral contracts between suppliers uh, and retailers. Um, <clears throat> and the idea behind this, and it works very well in theory, um, is that because it's a bilateral long-term contract, the supplier essentially takes on the reputational risk of the retailer. And it's, of course, the retailer who gets into the firing line. If your lights go off because there's not enough electricity, then, of course, you start complaining to the people who supply, who sell the electricity to you. But those people are actually not the people who make the electricity. That's a second set of companies that uh, hides uh, behind them. Um, and the idea of this long-term bilateral contracts was that the suppliers of electricity, the people who make the electrons, or rather take them away, um, that they would sort of buy into this whole idea of keeping the public happy and making sure that there would no blackouts would occur. It works in theory. It's one of those beautiful models in industrial organization or the, the, the theory of the firm that if you write down the equations, it works a dream. England and Wales is the only place on the planet where we've tried this in practice. Theory notwithstanding, it does not work. Right? What has happened in England and Wales is that people said, we're not going to invest money in big uh, plants. We're going to sweat our assets. We're just going to not invest or invest very little. We're just going to try and make as much money as we can without thinking about the long-term future. What they do in other jurisdictions um, is the same as with reserve capacity. Essentially, the regulator organizes an auction and says, we need picking power. Who is going to supply this? We're going to pay you for this. And we're going to pay this from what is essentially a cross-subsidy, a tax or a levy on all electricity suppliers. That, of course, ends up on your bill uh, eventually, right? It's not taken out of uh, their profits. Um, <coughs> England and Wales are moving there, mostly thanks to pressure from Brussels. Um, EU is not all bad, right? Uh, sometimes they do very uh, good things, in this case knocking some sense into uh, English uh, energy uh, regulators who maybe not the ones to blame, right? <coughs> um, 
these problems of picking power is exacerbated by the presence of intermittent renewables on the grid, particularly wind. Um, wind is unpredictable. Sometimes you have a lot of it, sometimes you have little of it. We just don't know when. There is no way of being able to coordinate the peak supply of wind with the peak demand for electricity. Um, <coughs> what happens with wind, essentially, in, in, in again the merit curve, is that the thing shifts. It's not just demand that shifts back and forth. Uh, but it's also the supply that shifts unpredictably uh, back and forth. Um, which just means that you need to keep these plants on standby. It used to be that your old diesel generators would only be used two months a year. Uh, so the rest of the year you would just block the power plant and move your people elsewhere. Now you need to be there on standby the whole year round and so on and so forth. It just increases uh, the supply. Also, <coughs> if you turn a power plant up and down and up and down and up and down, then it starts to break. Particularly coal-fired power plants and particularly nuclear power plants are designed to supply a constant amount of electricity. That is what the machinery is built for. If you turn it on and off and on and off and on and off, it'll break. Because pipes heat up, cool down, heat up, cool down, and so on and so forth. Wires heat up, cool down, heat up, cool down, the thing starts to break. So there is pecuniary uh, externalities to wind supply as well. And that all makes investing in thermal plants, uh, <coughs> in peak plants, uh, less uh, attractive. Um, so that is one problem, it has to do with uh, climate policy. There's also an older problem uh, called acid rain. Uh, you need to ask your parents, looking around the room, uh, most of you are too young to recall this. Uh, we used to have a problem called uh, acid rain in Europe. Basically close, <coughs> solved the problem, but yeah, regulator, uh, regulations take a long time to uh, hold effect. And because of the policies against acid rain, we are still closing down the big sources of sulfur, which causes uh, acid rain, and a big source of, and one of the big remaining sources of sulfur in the environment are coal-fired power plants. So that is the reason why we're shutting them down. Um, <coughs> so what have we done? Uh, what has the regulator done, I should say, uh, to make sure uh, that blackouts don't happen? What are these emergency measures uh, that I talked about? Uh, Stimulated wind, stimulated nuclear, um, and more constructively, uh, in large businesses, there are often called interruptible supply contra uh, contracts, and Tesco's would be one uh, that has such a, a contract. And essentially, what happens if the demand for electricity goes up, and it goes up, comes dangerously close to the supply of electricity, then a signal goes out to Tesco, and then Tesco sends a signal to all its supermarkets, and in all supermarkets the temperature in the fridges is turned up by a few degrees for a few hours only. So don't worry about your pizza being spoiled or anything. It's still cold enough for the food to be preserved, but it does save a lot of electricity demand. Um, and Tesco is actually making good money out of this, right? They are paid much more for demanding less electricity per kilowatt hour uh, than they are paying for their electricity. So this is actually a money spinner for Tesco and similar companies who do not have a constant and immediate demand for electricity. In the future, this will also be the case for the fridge in your house, right? Once you have a smart meter connected to a smart appliance, the same would happen in your house, but not uh, at the moment. <coughs> uh, the other thing that the regulator uh, has done last winter and the winter before is to put a lot of old bangers uh, on the grid, uh, revive them, diesel generators, uh, and this winter for the first time we are reviving some of these old coal-fired pow uh, coal power plants that we turned off because of acid rain. We're turning them back on to run on standby in case we're running out of electricity. Sort of an environmental disaster. Um, 
but uh, it's perhaps preferable uh, than having the lights come on. Um, so that is uh, what the regulator has done. In the background, uh, there is, of course, the whole uh, nuclear uh, discussion. Uh, when Ed Miliband uh, was Secretary for Energy, uh, he announced uh, that the UK would build 10 new nuclear power plants by 2020. Uh, that, I think, was a time span of 11 years uh, when he made uh, that uh, announcement. Um, <coughs> Some of us almost fell off our chair laughing, right? What you're looking at in the graph is the number of power plants that were built worldwide in any given uh, year. And the years are not displayed here. Um, but yeah, and this is worldwide. Ten nuclear power plants in ten years' time in the UK only. That just... That puts us uh, in league with... Uh, China in terms of the speed of which you will build these things. That's an unimaginable that a country that takes 70 years uh, to decide on, perhaps, on uh, a third runway, all of a sudden can turn around and build t 10 new nuclear power plants in 10 years' time. It just doesn't, doesn't work. You actually can't build a nuclear power plant in 10 years' time. It just You need so much concrete, so much steel, you just can't do it. Um, and also, actually, what you need in the conventional design of a nuclear power plant is a big vessel that contains the material. There's only one company on the planet that can build these vessels, which on the one end is high-tech precision engineering, but on the other hand is doing these things at a really large scale. There's only one company that can do that on the planet. It's a company in Japan, and it has a waiting list of 15 years. 15 <coughs> years to deliver a new nuclear vessel. So the idea that you could go to this company and say, I need 10, 10 of these things by, 2015, uh, by 2020, is just ridiculous, right? Um, I'll come back why I'm saying this uh, so strongly uh, in a few minutes now. But that is what Milliband wants to do, right? Um, <coughs> Of course, he wasn't long in power uh, after that. Uh, we had a coalition government between the Tories and the Lib Dems. They maintained this. They wanted a lot of nuclear, just like the Labour government uh, before them, but they insisted for a very long time that zero subsidies would be given. They were negotiating with a number of companies that could build these things in the UK, and they keep, kept insisting on zero subsidies will flow uh, to uh, these new nuclear power plants until all the companies had walked away, apart from ADF, Electricité de France. Um, and at that point, the government decided uh, to choice the choice between scaring off ADF as well or giving in to the demands of what by now was a monopsonist. Right? There was only one company left willing to build nuclear uh, in the UK, and we just gave in uh, to their demands. The alternative would be uh, that the then secretary um, for energy would get a lot of egg on his face, right? And that was uh, Davies, but, uh, Davy, sorry. Um, <coughs> and as you probably know, the current government uh, has decided to continue with Hinckley C. Um, Going to pay two or three times the, 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 their reward, the price that they negotiated is three times the wholesale price at the moment. We are buying electricity that is 200% more expensive than needed. That is the Hinkley C deal. And then there's a lot of hidden subsidies uh, behind it as well, hidden guarantees and so on and so forth. Um, and they plan to repeat this uh, twice. Um, <coughs> The crucial part behind all this um, is so-called regulatory uncertainty. And I make the argument that the power market is and should be heavily, heavily regulated. Um, power plants last a long time. Gas-fired power plants have a lifetime of 25 years. 
coal-fired 40 to 60 years, nuclear 30, 40, 50 years. They take a long time to plan, they take a long time to build, particularly coal and nuclear, which means that you're making a decision now for a plant that will be operational in a decade from now and will still work in 40 or 50 years from now. So essentially you're making a bet on the future. It's a long-term investment. But it's also a bet for which the profitability, the payoff, greatly depends on what future regulations will be. So you're not just making a bet on the market, which is difficult enough, you're also making a bet on what politicians will say and will do. And not just the clowns that are currently in power, but also the clowns that will be in power six, seven, eight gener uh, elections from now. This is very, very difficult, right? Um, and as a result, if you have policy that keeps changing, politicians who don't really seem to be on top of their brief, as I said, when Miliband made that announcement, people in the know fell off their chair laughing, right? Because it was just such, such a ridiculous thing to say. If that is what your profits depend upon, that hopefully in 2030 you will have a politician in charge of your profits who is a bit less brazen uh, than at Miliband, then that adds a risk premium to your investment, right? Uh, and if the risk premium is high enough, you simply walk away from this market. Um, <clears throat> and that is exactly uh, the situation where the UK, uh, in which the UK finds itself. as a weak regulator, and it's essentially the politicians who are in charge, and politicians are very excitable. I'm uh, showing here uh, the energy, the pictures of the energy secretaries, uh, and I've been talking about Miliband. Um, Miliband is saying compared to whom, um, if you look at the faces, you also immediately see that a lot of these politicians don't really see energy regulation as they're calling, but really they take the Department of Energy, etc., as a step up to higher political office. They're not interested in having the right policy, they're interested in making the right gimmicks so that people will vote them in to become the next Prime Minister or the next Chancellor, right? That is energy policy uh, in the UK. And uh, as a Shell uh, executive uh, likes to say, they'd rather do business, sorry, this is Exxon Mobile, they'd rather do business in Venezuela, where you have a competent and reliable government compared to the government in the UK, right? That is the image abroad of UK uh, energy policy. Um, so will the lights go out? We'll see. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, we will know uh, over the next 10 weeks or so. Um, <coughs> this is, I think, a big problem. Um, the political, there has been some attention to this, but you should of course also be aware that power generation is essentially anonymous. There's a few big companies that do these. They're not in the headlights uh, in the headlines uh, that much. The political attention is where the voters are. <coughs> and that is on the retail side of the side of the market. That's where the voters are. So there's been a lot of political attention paid to what is going on in the retail market. Um, where there is not necessarily a problem. Um, and there's been accusations of price gouging by the big six. Do they show signs of monopolistic behavior? Um, if you look at a breakdown of the dual fuel bill, so the gas and the electricity, uh, where does the money go to? It goes to wholesale, it goes to network, it uh, goes to environmental taxes, goes to supplier costs, goes to uh, the VAT. And actually, the green bit that you see there, that's their profit. This doesn't look like price gouging behavior to me, right? This looks like a fairly small, that their profits are a fairly small part of your electricity. <coughs> the returns on investment in this sector are 4 to 
they are laggards, they are not leaders, they are not making lots of money. This is not Elsevier who makes 38% uh, return on investment. That is what price gouging looks like, a 40% profit on your investment, not 4%. Um, <coughs> and this is exactly what you would expect. If you go back to uh, La Fonte and Tirol, right? Yes, we know that a perfect market, in order for the general equilibrium to be in the core, we need an infinite number of suppliers. Right? That is what micro theory tells you. But if we actually go to somewhat later theoretical developments, and we look at industrial organization and the, the, the theory of, of uh, oligopolies, then what Tirol and Lefont showed is that you have six suppliers. Six is infinitely many. A, s a market with six suppliers is almost as competitive as a market with an infinite number of suppliers. And we have six large suppliers. And by now, we also have a great many smaller ones. And if you look at the retail markets, you now can choose from a list of 40 companies of people who want to sell you electricity. So there's no immediate reason to assume that there's market power. Retail market is, of course, far from perfect. One of the reasons that it's far from perfect is because people are reluctant to switch supplier it's much easier to stay with your current company than to switch to the next. And they've made it a lot easier to switch electricity supplier, but people are still worried about blackouts in their own home and being cut off and all those sort of things and having to deal with uh, a whole set of, um, <coughs> of help desks who are not very helpful and so on and so forth. People just don't want the hassle uh, of switching. Um, <coughs> And knowing this, knowing that this market is imperfect, knowing that people don't like to switch, um, there's been a number uh, of interventions, all of which backfired, right? And that is why the Velvet Underground uh, is on your uh, reading list uh, for this week. Um, so at one point, the government decided to forbid price discrimination. One of the things that struck people is that if you switch supplier, you get a lower electricity tariff than if you have been with a company for a long time. And they said, no, 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 everybody must pay the same for this company, right? Of course, the company, that's what the government regulation was, and of course, then the company said, okay, then everybody's going to pay the high tariff rather than the low tariff, and we're not going to seduce people to switch to our company by offering discounts in the first year. Um, so the result of this government intervention well meant was higher prices on average and less competition, right? Um, the government looked, and this was the Prime Minister, uh, looked at one of these price comparison websites and sort of said, oh my God, this is very, very complicated. You have all these companies offering very different tariffs and some companies offer 20 or more tariffs. And of course, if you have 40 suppliers, you have hundreds and hundreds of uh, tariffs that people have to wade through in order to find the best tariff for them. This is all way too complicated. Let's make it simple, right? Let's say companies cannot supply more than four uh, electricity tariffs. That increases transparency, right? <coughs> of course, the, the way company, and it, this, this was... Uh, David Cameron on live television making policy, right? He had not talked to his advisors, he had not bothered to talk to the uh, Secretary for Energy, he had not bothered to talk to the regulator. This was David Cameron on live telly making policy, right? Let's just cut it to four. Of course, what happened immediately is all the tariffs that were profitable for people in particular nieces, say people who sleep at day and work at night, uh, they were immediately taken off the market. All the cheap tariffs uh, were taken uh, off the market. Of course, if you have fewer choice, there's less competition, right? Um, the government also at one point announced that everybody should be offered the option to switch to the lowest tariff of a particular company. Of course, the retailers immediately said, fine, we're going to take the lowest tariffs off the market. Right? Um, lots of promises being made. Uh, lots of well-meant regulation, but um, not particularly helpful. 
Um, and then, of course, there's also been uh, occasional talk of um, direct price regulation, which, of course, immediately meant uh, that prices went up. I think that the core problem here is the structure, the political structure of the regulation. What is the Prime Minister thinking if he goes on live television making policy on the hoof? What sort of nonsense is that? That you have a Prime Minister who has this power and a Prime Minister who is such an idiot that he actually thinks that he can use this power, right? Who is the guy on the left? Who is the guy on the right? The guy on the left is Mark Carney. He's a household name, not particularly after uh, what happened over the weekend. He is a household name. He is the head of the Bank of England, which is an independent organization. And if some politician comes up with a silly idea of monetary policy, Mark Carney puts them back in their case, right? The guy on the right is Dermot Nolan, who is the head of the independent electricity or energy regulator. He is not a household name. If politicians tell him to jump, he jumps. Even though he has statutory independence, he does not have the stature to tell politicians to go away. Right? And that is a crucial, fundamental problem in UK energy policy, that politicians who are necessarily generalists, who are necessarily distracted by all sorts of things, who are necessarily focused on the next election or focused on the current power battle, they are not the ones to make complicated decisions about complicated markets. With monetary policy, after a long, long time, we've learned that lesson and outsourced it to a technocrat. Uh, we said, this is your inflation target, now you sort out the details. With energy, which arguably is much more complicated than monetary policy in, in, in some ways, we don't have that. Uh, <clears throat> and I think that that is the fundamental solution to this problem, where we say that Parliament sets the parameters, and in energy we also talk, always talk about the energy trilemma. We want the electricity to be reliable, that the lights don't go out. We want it to be affordable, that people can actually pay for this service uh, or this product. And we want it to be clean, not to uh, pollute the environment. Um, <coughs> Parliament should set the parameters of the trilemma, and we should really leave it to technocrats to sort out the details. If not, we are in the situation where we are with a fairly silly uh, energy policy, a fairly silly energy policy that has now lasted for 30 years, and the consequence is that there is a high probability that sometimes during this winter the lights will go out. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention.